The Elder Scrolls. Most people have played the 10th game in the series known as Skyrim. But there were nine games before it, and as such, there is quite a bit of history, game backstory, collectively known as lore, that people really don't know about. Which is why I'm starting this Elder Scrolls lore series. Keep in mind that unlike other franchises such as Dragon Age, a lot of Elder Scrolls lore comes from out-of-game sources. And if you'd like to take your time and understand that a little bit better, check out the previous episode where I talk about the Elder Scrolls lore as a concept and explain the lore community in general. Now a quick disclaimer before I get started, this is my personal interpretation of the lore and as such any statements made here may vary radically from those of your friendly neighborhood lore master. But if you're okay with that, let's get on to episode 2. The real start to the series, the origin of the Elder Scrolls universe. The universe began with a very simple concept, all is one. An unfathomable place beyond understanding. Within that place there was one being, Anu, the everything. Anu, the original being, a force of stasis and permanency. Within this unfathomable existence, Anu came in contact with Padome. Padome, we can best understand, represents chaos and change, and in their meeting would begin what would be known as the Divine Interplay, where things would be arranged in order, that order would be changed, that change would be destroyed, reverted back into Anustasis, and the cycle would continue again and again, forming a great chaos and order dichotomy known as Arbus. Arbus is the actual universe where the Elder Scrolls takes place. Neither Anu nor Padome had identity. To understand itself, Anu, the same way single-celled organisms reproduce, birthed a soul of itself. This soul would allow itself to view itself from the outside, from a third-person perspective, allowing Anu to affirm Anu's own existence. The soul will be known as Anui El, and took the form of an everlasting light, and is the soul and substance of all things. At the same time, Padume mirrored this action and birthed a soul known as Sithis. Sithis was the void itself, the absence of substance, but it was also a force of change and separation. The concept of substance allowed things to exist, and the concept of the void allowed things to exist separately from one another. This allowed Aetherius to exist, the eternal plane. Now when I talk about existence and separation, I'm not talking about material existence, but rather the existence of energy or spirit. As Anu and Padome did before them, so too did Anuiel and Sithis each birth a spirit. Anuiel would birth the original spirit that would govern time, the Oversoul, Akka. Akka does not exist in our timeline. Rather, a shard of him, known as Ariel, would take his place as the beginning of time. Sithis, on the other hand, birthed the original spirit that would govern the space within the void, the soul of Lorcan. This is how Aetherius developed the base framework for space and time, although the actual effects of substance and time as we know them had not yet manifested. It was still a very alien, metaphysical place that we really couldn't understand as mortals. Anui El and Sithis would, in turn, birth many more original spirits, each unique, but each could draw their source back to either stasis or chaos, existence or separation. These spirits had a sense of self, but did not have a sense of purpose within the Aetherius. Eventually, the first of the original spirits would develop a deeper awareness that caused a massive shift within the Aetherius. As the original spirit who governs time became more deeply aware, so too did the other spirits feel a purpose within the flow of time he had created. The spirit who governed space was in turn driven by his purpose to create a new concept of his own. This time would be known as the Convention, when Lorcan convinced the other spirits to gather together within the void existing 
both within and beside Aetherius. It was at this time they established the framework for Mundus, the material plane. It was, as Lorcan proposed, supposed to be a paradise for all the original spirits to live in, to grow in. Although Lorcan was the creator of this world, another spirit known as Magnus was its architect. Magnus, who made the whole thing possible. His followers were responsible for creating the pocket in which our material plane would exist. During this time, nearly all the original spirits gathered. The number of spirits that did participate were beyond counting. Following Lorcan's goal and Magnus's designs, they constructed their paradise, which would become the Sphere of Mundus. A few spirits gave of themselves willingly to Lorcan's plan. These spirits would become the Earth Bones, or the Elnafe and were the foundation of the forces of nature that governed the new world that would be created. However, most, Magnus included, did not know the terrible price they would pay for aiding Lorcan. As creation was experiencing its last moments, many of the lesser spirits who were aiding them began to die. It was in that moment that Magnus came to several realizations, first and foremost, that it was the power of the original spirits being drained that Lorcan was using to make his vision a reality. Second, that Mundus, the material plane, was dangerous and had the power to affect everything, including Aetherius and beyond. Finally, that Mundus was highly unstable and threatened to collapse at any second. Believing that the plan had to be terminated immediately, Magnus gathered up all the spirits he could, all of his followers, and met. Although Magnus could not reach all the spirits in time, all those who were willing to follow him left Mundus in its final moments prior to its finalization. Magnus, being one of the greater original spirits, tore a massive hole in space as he fled creation. This hole allowed the light of Aetherius to shine through and fill our world with magicka. This hole would be known as the Sun. All the other spirits who followed Magnus tore smaller holes in the fabric of the physical world as they fled in all directions. These holes would be the stars. With Magnus and his followers gone, Mundus stabilized completely, the threat of collapse gone. As far as we can tell, this too was a part of Lorcan's plan. The effect on the spirits whom remained in Mundus either by choice or by lack of warning was dramatic. Those who didn't outright die were affected by the new forces as their divinity was drained to create the mortal world. These original spirits, both lesser and greater, whom landed were stripped of their greater divinity and found themselves limited by the new world that they were in. The greater spirits were able to remain spirits, whereas the lesser spirits faded and became Elnafe. These original spirits, now limited by the world, could be thought of as living gods. They existed physically and they could be killed. Now among these spirits, a great division began to form, those who supported Lorcan and those who blamed him for the loss of their divine status. Those who opposed Lorcan were led by Ariel. Not an Elnafe, still an original spirit, but locked within a prison of mortality. Time is by its very nature limitless, however within Lorcan's creation, limitations were imposed upon Ariel. This disconnect in conjunction with other factors I will not explain here, caused the Oversoul, Akka, to shatter into an unknowable number of shards. These shards exist at varying points in the infinite string of time, each representing an aspect of time itself. Ariel represents the beginning of time, the start of the journey along the wheel. He existed as a mortal being in the Dawn Era and is considered the ancestor to all the Aldmer. Other shards of the Time God would be known as Akatosh and Alduin, representing the body and end of time respectively. However, in our timeline, Akka, the original Time God, never existed. His place in the convention and the general Dawn Era was replaced by Ariel permanently. 
Ariel gathered all of the original spirits and Elnafe who opposed Lorcan and brought them to the Adamantine Tower. While the entire project to create Mundus was collectively known as the Convention, the very moment to which Ariel gathered everyone to decide Lorcan's punishment, that was the moment of the Convention. The armies of original spirits and Elnafe, led by Ariel, went against the armies of Lorcan. Lorcan had not only original spirits and Elnafe by his side, but he also had a brand new race of people, known as men. The origin of the race of man varies depending on which race you ask. However, many believe that they were created directly by Lorcan or by Kine using Lorcan's power. The ultimate conclusion of the war between Ariel and Lorcan had Ariel's greatest knight, an original spirit known as Trinamac, striking down Lorcan and tearing his heart out on the field of battle. Ariel and Trinamac had originally decided to destroy the heart, but found themselves unable to do so. It was at that moment that the heart laughed at them and said, This heart is the heart of the world, for one was made to satisfy the other. Although Lorcan had been killed that day, and was actually dead as a person, his presence as a divine being and his divine powers remained within his heart, for it was the heart of the world. And for as long as the world would exist, so too would his heart. And so standing victorious over the field of battle, Ariel and his knight Trinimac faced the ocean to the east of Tamriel. Ariel tied the heart of Lorcan to an arrow, and using his mighty bow, he shot the heart of Lorcan east into the ocean. Although his goal was to ensure that the heart of Lorcan would never be found, the heart would defy him, and from the depths of the ocean, a volcano would rise. And by the end of the Dawn Era, the island of Vardenfell would be formed in Morrowind, the great volcano housing the heart of Lorcan. By the time this event had occurred, Nearly all of the original spirits, save Ariel, Trinimac, and a few others, had completely faded and become Elnafe. The form they took as Elnafe would be dependent on where they landed in the world. The word Elnafe is a catch-all, and in later eras, most people whom speak of Elnafe, they mean the Earth Bones, those who willingly gave themselves to the world in order to become its foundations. But most, if not all of those Earthbones, were devout followers of Lorcan, as many original spirits whom participated in the Grand Endeavor were. These Elnafe retained their chosen forms as elemental lords, closely resembling Atronox. However, as time progressed, they fell asleep within Nurn itself, and were not seen unless otherwise summoned by their followers. Now, most of the Elnafe who rejected Lorcan, but failed to flee Nern, gathered in one place. And because they pooled together what they had, they were able to retain much of what they originally were before being stripped of their divinity. They called themselves the original people, the old Elnafe. They are the children of Ariel, not literally, but rather in spirit. The old Elnafe would eventually have their powers completely fade, and their descendants would be Aldmer, the precursors to the High Elves. All Aldmer saw themselves as being descended from divinity, specifically Ariel. Those who did not give themselves to Lorcan's creation willingly, and did not gather at that moment to become Old Elnafe, were shaped by the land they ended up in, plants, animals and monsters alike were formed from them, they would be collectively labeled as the Wandering Elnafe. These Wandering Elnafe in their present states retained their intelligence and their powers. However, successive generations of them would lose those original traits and they would become what the world intended them to be. The exception to this would be the race of men. The race of men in most legends came from wandering Elnafe that were rescued before their powers faded, and they were molded into a new race, either by Lorcan himself or by Kine on Lorcan's behalf. 
Propaganda in future generations would mold the imperial belief that Lorcan simply created the race of men out of nothing. This is an example, however, of one of many intentionally incorrect interpretations that was used to enrich the world of the Elder Scrolls. This closely mirrors real life, where religions and other belief systems are allowed to be corrupted by politics or money. Now going back to the Dawn Era, Ariel would guide all of the old Elnafe to the land of Eldmiris, separate from Tamriel where their culture would grow and flourish. In time, the wandering Elnafe, in their various forms, would find the old Elnafe. And the wandering Elnafe were delighted to see their brothers, those who were once spirits like them. However, the old Elnafe did not share their delight. What the old Elnafe saw were lesser, twisted creatures. They saw beings to be pitied, ones who had allowed themselves to be corrupted by the world Lorcan imprisoned them in. The rejection of the wandering Elnafe at the hands of the old Elnafe would spark another war between them. And this is the foundation of racism that the High Elves would carry with them into the future. The old Elnafe believed themselves superior to the wandering Elnafe. The Aldmer believed themselves superior to the lesser races that surrounded them. And while there was no documentation of these wars or their results, the Elnafe and their Aldmer descendants would endure for many generations. Although the old Elnafe did not suffer from aging as mortals do, they could still die through illness or injury. And over the ages, they died through illness and injury, and all that were left were their descendants, the Aldmer. And when the old Elnafe had gone, and the only people who remained were either original spirits or Aldmer. Ariel gathered up all the Aldmer peoples, and ascended before them, rose himself to divinity once more. Departing the mortal world in front of them, he showed the Aldmer that there was a path to ascension that they could follow, and this was the critical moment that set the High Elves on their path to seeking perfection in all they do. This was the defining trait of High Elf society. And it was the Aldmer who saw themselves as the direct descendants of their gods. They didn't see them as gods, but rather as ancestors. And everyone wants to live up to the legacy of their ancestors. But as mortal beings, looking at immortal ancestors, it's very easy to feel inadequate. And having a lifespan averaging over a thousand years, the Aldmer people would always seek perfection because perfection was the path to ascension. That is what they came to believe. At some point in time, there is no documentation around this, however, old Aldmeris was lost, and the Aldmer people would land on the Somerset Isles off the coast of Tamriel. However, not all the Aldmer went to Tamriel. Some went in different directions and ended up in different places. Generations later, Aldmer explorers would attempt to return to Old Aldmeris and find only ocean where charts said Aldmeris should have been. The Aldmer people questioned the accuracy of these charts, however, ultimately they had to accept the fact that their homeland, their place of origin, Old Aldmeris, was lost for good. In future eras, Imperial scholars would come up with a theory that Old Eldmiris never existed in the first place, and they originated on Tamriel. The theory goes on to explain that Akavir, Atmora, and Eldmiris were legends of the various races, and that in fact, Tamriel was the only source of life anywhere. This theory was another piece of information placed within the world of the Elder Scrolls to help enrich the world by showing that people don't really know everything and that time and multiple points of view can completely obscure the truth. And the Aldmer were not immune to this either. Earlier generations knew the old Elnafe. The Elnafe were ancient spirits that predated the world itself. They had a real connection 
with eternity, with divinity. That connection was lost over successive generations. No one remembered the El Nefe. The original spirits still walked the world, but they did so as gods. The people would lose touch with the fact that they were once relatives. And the repercussions of that lost connection we'll explore next time. If you are so inclined, like and share this episode with others. Every little bit helps. In the next episode, we will be ending the Dawn Era and starting the Merithic Era with the splitting of the High Elves into various Elfin races. Until then, I'll see you all next time.